Hello. Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with Robert McDowell and this time we're going to take a look about at uh, collections encompassing museums, galleries, libraries and universities. Robert recently delivered a lecture to the Folklore Society taking a look at the past, present and future of these institutions and their exhibits. Good to see you as ever. Thank you, Tony. Um, can we start off by uh, having a look at the recorded history of collections? Um, sure. When were the first ones noted? Any idea? Um, well, well, in in um, basically in the Renaissance, um, uh, people started to appreciate the past, if I could put it like that, and um, private uh, private collectors um, started to accumulate um, collections. Uh, not particularly from their own countries, but as you know, they started in that time to travel to the east and so on. And that is where a lot of the private collections evolved. So broad, broadly from the 1500s to the 1700s was when in modern times, uh, uh, wealthy individuals started to accumulate collections. And exhibit. Can I use the word souvenir? Uh, well, <clears throat> sou souvenir is something you remember something by I, I whether whether they were done for that purpose uh, is a matter of conjecture <laughs> well the, th the thing that i wanted the point that i wanted to make is was it plunder or negotiation or what well i i, I imagine it was it, it was a mix um sometimes there was a, a financial consideration uh, given for what was collected other times these uh, items were re were merely uh, uh, collected uh, to accumulate it without any resistance, dare I say, from the the, the people in uh, the jurisdiction where these uh, collections were. And then, of course, th th there was, uh, of course, plunder where uh, these collections were uh, uh, taken as a result of war and conflict. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, London is has a rich um, background to all of this stuff and when you sort of think about exhibition road you see the pinnacle of empire almost don't you with the vna the science museum imperial college natural history museum and everything else um at what point did it sort of become fashionable for effectively the state to start exhibiting i i think it was um it, literally in victorian times where these big uh, exhibition halls, exhibition centres, were a reflection on the on the power of the UK and the extent of the the empire and the wealth of the empire. And so they were they 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 were built as uh, in many ways as, as national national symbols of um, of economic and cultural virility, uh, along with the Crystal Palace. Along with yes, indeed, yeah, yeah yes. I mean, I, 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 well. You might even say the Crystal Palace was the sort of um, uh, catalyst for, for these. It was a, it was essentially a trade exhibition, but obviously there 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 was a lot of very valuable uh, cultural and historic material exhibited there. Absolutely. And and when when you look at the uh, various um, museums in Exhibition Road, they are big big places, aren't they? Big big p places, large buildings. Huge, huge collections uh, and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of stuff, um, uh, and they they're major tourist attractions, as we know. Yeah, and and presumably, you know, they didn't fill them up all, all at once, so they had the forethought to make them of a reasonable size, so that they could add to the exhibits as time went by. Uh, that's right, but uh, I mean, there was some uh, research done. I think it was earlier this year, where um, the average museum only exhibits about 15 to 20 percent of its collections. The, the rest are in storage, archive and sometimes lent out to other museums. Yeah. OK. These things must cost a lot of money to run, Robert. Do they just rely on admission, you know, um, uh, funds <laughs> or, or what? <laughs> Well, this is the, this is the challenge, I suppose. Uh, I suppose funding comes from so three or four sources. There is government funding, which um, uh, diminishes over the years. Let, let me put it to you like that. Um, there are, of course, major exhibitions um, where which attract a greater number of the 
uh, of the public than the routine um, uh, uh, visitor. There are, of course, the continual visitor. And then there, there there's ephemera that are, that are sold at the shops. Um, and perhaps most importantly, um, they rely on uh, endowments and philanthropy. So um, some some collections do come with substantial endowments, which ensure that uh, there is good uh, curatorial skills uh, devoted to them. Um, uh, and also, I think they um, they also rely quite heavily on um, on academia uh, to provide what I call um, uh, uh, subsidized resource mm. in terms of research and uh, writing about uh, about the particular collection and exhibits. I mean, basically, um, an endowment in this context is a lump sum, which hopefully generates sufficient income to, to make it all work. But is there a formula for that, Robert? Um, no, no, there isn't, because if, if you look at uh, what can be left can be anything from a, a collection of papers or a library, <clears throat> through to a, a few very valuable objects. So each requires a different depth and range of range of skills. Uh, yeah. And also um, uh, space, storage space in particular. And, and that, that is particularly critical for, um, for libraries and, um, uh, and uh, people or events papers. I mean, going slightly off piece, presumably the Rhodes scholarships uh, 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 another example of an endowment that's um, still going strong, you know, all these years later. Yes, very, very strong. But but that was essentially uh, from Cecil Rhodes' um, investments, if I could. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> like that, I'm happy to go into more detail, but but I, I think most people would understand what I meant by that. Golden diamonds. <laughs> Golden diamonds. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, let's get back on peace now <laughs> and talk about um, the Folklore um, Society uh, Library, which uh, you're very au fait with. And um, that's temporarily parked at the UCL. Well, is it, that, that's actually an interesting history. It's been there since 1910, believe it or not. Um, the uh, the Folklore Society was founded in the 1860s by what I call uh, uh, antiquarian gentlemen. Um, and uh, they had a, the, the books and collection were kept elsewhere. There was a fire and they did a, a deal, I suppose you'd call it, with University College London, whereby they would donate the collection of books to the library and in exchange... The the, uh, uh, the 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 library there'd, there'd be a library a browsing library which could be used by members of the folklore society and then an administrative room there and that continued actually up until the year two thousand when the folklore society uh, moved to the Warburg Institute partly because of the uh, libraries then became um, retrie retrieval libraries rather than browsing libraries and the library was wanted for teaching space um, so the uh, the uh, uh, the event or slightly moved to the Warburg. However, uh, and I was actually involved in this. We did sign a stewardship agreement with University College London, whereby they would maintain the index, the catalogue of, of the library, and also books and book collections which are left to the folklore society do go there. So, and and obviously that library is available to you know students, uh, academics, uh, 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 and also. Uh, members of the folklore society and it's um it, it's um most interesting recently um there's been a uh, a new director of library services who's obviously looking at the collections and uh, she has interestingly enough said that the folklore society book collection which is some 19,000 books it is a collection of national interest and therefore U university college is going to devote what a, I suppose I call more tender loving care to yeah. it yeah uh, but we have a stewardship <laughs> agreement and there are certain protocols and procedures that have to be done like checking that the that, that the index uh, corresponds to the number of books etc but but with the agreement that you have the stewardship agreement is that open-ended or for a set number it, it, of years it, it's open-ended until either party wishes to vary it. okay yeah yeah so um, you know 
there's a bit of discretion on each side there, as it were. That's right, and it's um, it, it's it, it's fairly it's fairly comprehensive. I mean, it may be an argument now to to revisit it in light of um, yeah, some of the technology changes, etc. But it, it's been in place since two thousand and two, I think it is. Could you see a situation where some of the um, works held there were digitalized? Yeah. Yes. Um, the of, of the collection about nineteen thousand books, <clears throat> one and a half thousand are deemed to be rare books. Yeah. Things like first editions of Grimm's fairy tales and so on. And they are actually held um in a more secure place uh, than the other books. Um and there are there are protocols for accessing uh, accessing those. And uh I mean, the collection uh, was last valued for insurance purposes at nine hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So it's wow. a it's a reasonable, yeah, yeah. reasonable value. Yeah. Um, some a, a lot of the other books um, are now available in digital form, and um, yeah, the, 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 there is an argument that some of the books could be deaccessioned. Um, I, I, I think the Folklore Society's view would be uh, well. Let let UCL take the first move on that. <laughs> Having watched your webinar, there was a delightful colleague of yours yeah. who mentioned that I don't know what the collective yeah. noun would be, but he mentioned mangles, <laughs> and there are lots of mangles apparently. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean I I think that colleague he 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 was the curator of the East Anglian. Uh, rural rural studies museum actually yeah, uh, yeah. which i think is it is and uh, i think the point he was making was that they they were forever being given old mangles <laughs> <laughs> they only wanted one <laughs> and this is this is of course one of the problems with um uh, with collections people uh, in their wills and uh, their executors and uh, family uh, are, are often so willing to give a collections anything from sort of old papers and memoirs um to to books and objects d'art uh, to organizations but of course um one doesn't want them very often without the uh, the, the the funding to to go through and review them uh, yeah sure uh, that's a big big challenge yeah uh, 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 and it's been me, me, even more exacerbated than some of the bigger bigger museums particularly the local authority museums i have to say coming back to the agreement um, what's the yep. situation then regarding public access to to your libraries? Is that an impossibility, or uh, do you have to no, be a member, or what? Uh, you have to be a member. However, um, bona fide researchers and so on uh, can get a special uh, ticket um, to the library. Um, as I say, if it's if it's of the rare books, then those are seen under supervision. Yeah, sure. Unless we, uh, you you have had. Uh, historic issues, uh, funny enough, with the Bodleian, where academics used to uh, cut plates out of books, believe it or not, and uh, frame them and sell them on. So you've got to be very, very careful with these sort of things. Academic <laughs> vandals. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, I, you know, I have to say, uh, academics can be uh, rather obsessive about these sort of things, and uh, you know, historically haven't been above. Um, uh, secreting uh, materials in their person uh, for their own profit, ultimately. As, of course, was... Yeah, quite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what about <laughs> um, the UK government? Uh, they, they offer to tax breaks, do they, to donors, thinking particularly of inheritance uh, tax? Yeah. Yes, they do. I mean, it has to be considered a... Um, uh, a work of art or of quote cultural importance. Yeah. Um, so you know, my old musty papers probably wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't qualify. Uh, however, uh, obviously, take someone like Winston Churchill for example. Yeah. He, 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 there was huge tax break on on, on his collection. So, um, so it, it very theoretically. Uh, HMRC decide these things, although there are, there are very strong guidance from people who are perhaps a little more cultured than HMRC. 
yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, we 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 touched on philanthropy just now. I, I suppose the Tate galleries are a good yeah. example of somebody that made a lot of money out of sugar and and um, was able to sort of put it into art and stuff like that. Well, indeed, and you 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 have the Royal Academy, which had a uh, a Sackler gallery, and the Sacklers were involved in um coming to some some disrepute so uh, their name has been uh, extinguished and so on so uh, yes uh, what, what, different when, ages look at... yeah sorry just missed the what they were involved in the uh, thing froze just for uh, a second uh, opioids opioids in the oh, states right, okay. These, yeah yeah which have a, a, a create a level of dependency and um, uh, they allegedly exploited uh, that um, pharmaceuticals 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 <laughs> yeah yes that's a polite way of putting it yes uh, of, a, of, a, of a dodgy nature <laughs> but but you see i mean each each age uh each generation views these things somewhat differently mm, yeah yeah absolutely yeah now <clears throat> mo most of these organizations that are holding collections have trustees What's yes. the role of the and um, responsibility of the trustee on these matters? The the the, the trustees two things. One is to uh, ensure that there is good stewardship of these collections, so proper records, proper security, um, uh, keeping them in good order. Um, sometimes exhibiting them and. Uh, Occasionally, um, some collections are left uh, with very specific instructions, and those have to be carried out. So the the trustees are responsible for, for, for the sort of good order of, of that. And um, it, it, it's a somewhat difficult job because you rely upon the uh, curator, the director of the museum uh, to uh, to do this. Um, obviously, there are there are, should be periodic audit and other checks. And I think that was one of the things that let the British Museum down because they hadn't had these uh, uh, periodic uh, checks that the inventory matched the records. Um, but it's it's a very responsible job. And uh, uh, the, 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 there are sometimes uh, some concern that the trustees uh, perhaps go too much with the uh, political push, if I can put it like that, they get more concerned about the provenance, about uh, making accessibility and how that is made, without perhaps always looking more closely at the uh, at the ha what I call the housekeeping issues. But taking the mu British Museum situation, yeah. are the trustees responsible for the losses, or or would you put that down to yeah. management? Um. Ultimately, yeah, yes, they are. I mean, you know, um, management uh, is being, um, how should I put it, um, uh, subjected to uh, disciplinary measures because they have failed to do certain things. But ultimately, it's the trustee's responsibility. And uh, the, the, a former trustee who is a partner in um, the law firm Slaughter and May is doing a what I usually describe as a drains up. On, right. on, <laughs> right. on the stewardship uh, of of uh, the uh, British Museum's collection, so I, I I mean it's not due out till I think the middle of next year, and I suspect you know the trustees will probably have to they will, there'll be some acts of contrition, yes, in whatever form uh, but, by the trustees. But the thing is that this goes back a long, long time, doesn't it? Potentially, so a lot of the trustees that were trustees at the time. Are perhaps dead or or perhaps no longer involved at all. So you know it seems I suppose up to a point a bit unfair on the current trustees. But having said that, <laughs> having said that, presumably they have a responsibility to make sure that everything's kosher before they actually um, take on the responsibility. Well, well, they should do. I mean, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> in these sort of museums, learning societies, and so on, um, people uh, like the uh, kudos, the, uh, the reputation of becoming a trustee, and perhaps they don't always examine the uh, these matters in as much detail as they as they should. Um, I mean, my personal view is that uh, when you come aboard, you should uh, you should ask a number of searching questions. Mm. Um, 
of the other trustees and uh, you know the uh, the director of the museum and curator and so on to at least satisfy yourself um in that sense you've you've done your due diligence and that may mitigate against some of the liability against you now looking at the situation in the uk regarding local authorities and as you know the my favourite is Woking Borough Council with an alleged deficit of £2.6 billion. They're bust, yeah. they're bankrupt. Where does that put the collections if a local authority does go bankrupt? Well, um, it, it, it depends on the terms of those collections, inevitably. Um, uh, some collections um, would revert uh, to the uh, to the owners or their uh, successors uh, in the event of bankruptcy. Um, others, well, it would be a question, first of all, if ownership uh, was uh, fully established uh, with the with the uh, local authority, uh, there would have to be a process of deaccessioning. Hmm. Um, uh, and it's quite a, uh, I've got a very large flow chart, which I won't show you. <laughs> but but uh, you, you have to go through a number of uh, a number of fairly detailed steps as part of a deaccessioning process. So assuming uh, assuming the affairs of the local authority were with a uh, I'll call it a trustee in bankruptcy for the purposes of this discussion, uh, they would have to go through deaccessioning before they could be um, be sold to uh, uh, satisfy any uh, debts or other liabilities. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, I guess. Um, mm. When yeah. the when the local authority is in a situation where it's having to close the six public toilets, it says something, I think. <laughs> but there oh, we are. Oh, I, I mustn't oh, be too rude about them. <laughs> no, well, well, there are different ways of spending a penny, I suppose. Yeah, I guess you. I guess you're right from that point of view. And of course, with this the accessioning process, it could be flooding the mangle market, couldn't it? Well, 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 indeed it could because um, you, you, you see, when you when you bring collections onto the market, there are always private collectors, whether they're hobbyists or professional collectors. And uh, if you bring uh, a co collection of a particular genre on, it it, it can diminish the, the the value of collections in that market. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I, I mean, one thing that w was um, evident from your webinar was that, you know, the options are selling or leasing surplus exhibits. So yeah. I guess from that point of view, you know, you, you, you could move a collection into the private sector on a temporary lease basis, as it were. You, you, you could. That's right. And uh, I mean, my own view for what it's worth is the uh, the. Uh, the, the the more the um, challenge of getting people to leave uh, collections with endowments, the more will end up in private hands um, uh, because uh, and then it's up to private collectors again whether they they exhibit either uh, temporarily or privately or, uh, or or by specific arrangement with the uh, museums and learned societies. Now it's almost going back to what it was. In the Renaissance period. Yeah, absolutely. He's gone full circle. Yeah. Now, the Elgin marbles, should they yeah. ever be repatriated? I understand an act of parliament is required. Why is that? That is because of, it, because of the terms under which uh, they were given to the uh, to the museum. Right. Uh, so there would be have to be an act of parliament. I mean, if, if there is no resistance to their return, I suppose it, it, the act will be nodded through, literally. Mm, yeah. um, it, 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 if there is some uh, uh, resistance to it, then it would be it would be subject to uh, vigorous debate, I guess. So, do I take it that Lord Elgin acquired the aforementioned marbles, and then? donated yeah. them to the he, british museum that's absolutely correct yes he 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 he, he acquired them and then, uh, and then donated them and uh, I, I i'm i'm not uh, privy to the very specific terms but clearly clearly it was such that they could not go elsewhere without an act of parliament or they could have gone back to greece before they got to the british museum <laughs> well, 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 they could have done, but uh, you know, in the in those times, I think Greece was subject to periodic revolutions. And yes, I think yeah, the yeah. Marbles were, was not top of their 
would be <laughs> political priorities. Um, obviously, uh, cult, cultural, cultural, uh, cultural provenance and so on has become important, and also, of course, uh, they, they 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 could be a remarkable tourist attraction to Greece. Yeah, yeah, but equally, should ancient Egyptian artifacts go back to Egypt? Well, 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 again, um, yeah, I, 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 I'd argue the same, the, the same thing. Um, uh, the, the, it's, it, it's a dare, I, dare I say, it's a fashionable moral issue that uh, that these things should go back to where they came from. Uh, I mean, if you look at Iraq, for example, um, where which was devastated and uh, where a lot of treasures were uh, uh, literally. Uh, uh, Done to pieces uh, by the uh, jihadists and so mm. on. Um, I would be very, uh, very concerned about um, uh, 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 collections going back to places where there there isn't adequate security concern and stewardship. Yeah, in in other words, you you you'd be justified in retaining them on the Absolutely. basis that they would be kept in good order. Now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what about this question of insuring the artifact? Now, we saw Just Stop Oil the other day with a hammer in the National Gallery. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, I would think that the collection there is probably not capable of being insured, is it? No, 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 no. some of these very, very valuable pages are, are beyond. They're priceless. Beyond the yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you yeah, know, that's why they obviously have, you know, glass and other security protection measures to, pro to protect against these uh, idiotic vandals, mm. if I may use that term. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, there's, a, the, the, there's always that danger when you when you have um, exhibits uh, publicly exposed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we've uh, more or less got to uh, the end of the, the the list of topics that we've um, been through on this it's been very interesting um, and yeah. um, you know I'd like to thank you very much for your time as ever pleasure but uh, I mean I think this is something that is going to run and run um, the now that the uh, the culture media and sports uh, committee of parliament is now on the case and you know mps like to jump aboard the bad bandwagon so i think this this matter is going to run and run and it's not uh, and it's it's quite endemic as you may have observed from my uh my my, my webinar, webinar. i've yeah, had uh, yeah, a number yeah. of um a number of um i won't use the word whistleblowers but people who've who, who no longer work at museums and uh uh, then society saying that the collections have not been adequately uh, looked after or subject to the, the degree of stewardship that they should be. So it, it's, it's something's going to run and run, Tony. Thank you, Robert. We'll uh, look forward to perhaps talking about it a bit more in the future. Take care. Many, many thanks. Thank you, Tony. Bye.